And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Stephen Lewis, the health policy consultant. In New York, New York, Brian Golden, chair of the health sector strategy at the Rotman School of Management at the U of T. And here in studio, Danielle Martin, chair of Canadian Doctors for Medicare, and Michael Dechter, the former Ontario Deputy Minister of Health. Good to have everybody with us here today. We want to remind you that we call this a Your Agenda Thursday broadcast because we want you involved. You can reach us via Twitter at twitter.com slash the agenda or by email at theagenda at tvo.org. And of course, our own fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog at tvo.org slash the agenda. So please dial us up and join the debate. Here is the graph that I suspect is animating so much of healthcare discussion today. And you can see it here in the studio. Michael, if you would, put it up on the screen. This is where healthcare spending is today in the year 2010. It's roughly 43% of the Government of Ontario's program spending. That's almost 43 billion in this fiscal year. And as you see from that curve going up and up and up and up, the plan, or I guess if nothing happens, as we suggested in the opening, healthcare spending dwarfs everything else in the budget and becomes uh, huge, just huge, 70% of the estimates right now. There is a relentless increase to the cost of the healthcare system. Let's go around the horn and see if we can figure out why this is. Michael Dechter, why do healthcare costs go up so much every year? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, if you could have shown that same curve 10 years ago, and we did bend the curve. We plateaued it in the 90s for five years. Some things we did were smart. Some things we did weren't so smart. It goes up because 80% of that healthcare budget is wages, and people in the healthcare sector have done historically pretty well at bargaining with governments. They have the obvious uh, public on their side often in terms of shouldn't we pay our doctors and nurses well. The, this, a, another driver has been drug budgets, which have grown faster than anything else, and there's some good questions to be asked there. But the fundamental thing I'd say is it's easy to say, well, we're spending a vast amount more than we used to on health care. We're not buying the same package. We are doing remarkably better things for people than we could do for them 20 or 30 years okay, ago. Hold off on that. We're going to get okay. to that half of it later. But I, just for starters, again, Stephen Lewis, come on in here. Tell me, we've heard wages being one of the ideas, technology is one of the ideas, drug costs. What else is out there that, that ensures that that curve keeps going up and up and up at what everybody says is an unsustainable level? Well, the way the system is designed is inflationary. Uh, it's volume-based. It's driven by some very creative but not always useful new technology and new drugs. Uh, we substitute newer, very expensive drugs for older ones that are just as effective, four-fifths of new drug products, according to the U.S. Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, don't add any new ther therapeutic value. We do five times as much diagnostic imaging as we did 15 years ago, and there is no discernible benefit, at least at the very margins. And the quality experts estimate that we waste up to 30% of all healthcare spending. But we do this because we have taught ourselves and taught the people who work in the system that productivity means doing more. And the, the old saw that we talk a good game about investing upstream and keeping people healthy, but basically we spend $170 billion in Canada mainly on repairing illness. Hmm. Danielle Martin, what would you add to the list? Well, I mean, it's certainly true that health care costs are increasing, but the other component of this debate is to point out that health care costs are increasing as a proportion of provincial budgets, in part because provincial budgets across the country and provincial spending on everything else has been shrinking. In other words, it's also an, a denominator issue. So that the analogy is you've got a family of four who have dinner around the table every night. The eldest kid goes off to university. And three weeks later, the parents say to the remaining kid, I'm sorry, son, we're going to have to let you go. We can't afford to keep you around anymore. Last month, you were only eating 25% of the food in the house. And now you're eating 33% of it. So as we cut taxes, and as we decrease program spending in other areas, health care appears to be eating up a larger and larger proportion of our provincial budgets. And I think there's another debate that needs to be had about how much are we willing to spend uh, as collectively as a society on health care and on other things. Uh, because it's not really fair to the health care system to, to constantly point out how it's a Pac-Man of, of other stuff when in fact it's the denominator that's been shrinking. Okay, Brian, tell me this. There, there are Somebody who works at the Rotman School has got to know about this. The rules of regular economics are, let's say, over here on one side of the table. 
Do the rules of healthcare economics follow the same rules of economics of the rest of society? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of challenges. One of the things you'd see in regular economics or in market systems is some real competition based on some outcomes. And part of the problem I, I see is that we are paying a lot more in absolute terms, so it's not just a matter of the denominator shrinking. We are paying much more in absolute terms, and it's not clear that we are getting much more over the last few years, for example, uh, than we have in the past. We are getting better technologies, but we don't have real competition based on results. So, in fact, we spread those larger dollars evenly, and it's not clear we're getting good value for those dollars. In, in the market system, you'd see that. In which case, Michael Dechter, if we introduce more competition into the healthcare system, would we be able to bend that cost curve a little more? We've seen in Ontario two really good examples where competition has been valuable in shortening wait times. Uh, Dr. Alan Hudson, who led that initiative, took bids from hospitals. And for the first time, you had a kind of internal market. So hospitals said, we, we can, one hospital said, we can do cataracts for $500. Another one said $1,400. And a price was struck somewhere in the middle, $760. So for the first time, the people that had bid $1,400 had to look at, well, why are our costs double what others are spending? It, and it, it, it worked well there, and we have had dramatic shortening of wait times by using a kind of internal market. And although there are critics, I think it worked well in home care. But many parts of health care don't easily lend themselves to that kind of competition. For that to work, you need multiple market participants with well, relatively low barriers to entry. So you, you need actually competitors, and you need something you can measure um, in an easy way. But all of this is taking us in, in, I think, one very positive direction, which is to move hospitals from simply being paid to be there to actually being paid for what they do and how well they do it. You are obviously and evidently marvelously anticipating where I am going. Well, we are going to get to the sequence. issue of how hospitals okay. are paid. Just not quite yet, though. Uh, Brian, let me come back at you on that then. M Michael Decker has said there is some competition of a sort within healthcare right now that has managed to contain costs of a sort. Uh, is that adequate, do you think, to do the job? Uh, no, I don't think it's adequate, but I think it is in the right direction. Dr. Hudson uh, did some amazing work, but in only five areas, five clinical areas, uh, uh, including diagnostics. And what we saw there was simply getting the cost down. What we didn't measure at the time, and we were moving towards that, is the quality of the care. So we need to also have quality, and for there to be real competition, we need to provide better information, not just to the ministry and to the LINs that fund, but also to patients so that they have, where it's appropriate, options and they can choose with their uh, their feet where they are receive care. Now, I just want to say one thing. When I talk about competition, I'm not talking about private organizations, private sector or for profit. Uh, we have some very healthy competition in the public sector and that's where I think it ought to be. Okay. Now, Danielle Martin, when we I hear these different expressions, regular inflation, medical inflation. What's the difference? Well, I mean, just coming back to what Brian's been saying, I, I, I think there are some parts of, of, the, of the healthcare system and, and the medical care system that respond to the regular rules of economics, but a lot of the parts of the healthcare system don't. And in fact, picking up on some of the, the stuff we've been saying around competition, I think it's also important to point out that while there are some areas that where competition may be useful, again, within the public system, there are other areas of healthcare where, where competition will never be useful. Like what? Mental health care, for example. It's going to be very, I, I would be very hard pressed to think of an example where that, that would be a, uh, an area where competition would be useful for you, patients. You, you mean within the public system? Even or? within the public system. There are areas of health care where collaboration is much more important than anything else. Uh, children's mental health, most primary care, a, a lot of uh, prevention, promotion, public health. So areas where actually we need to be focusing a lot of our efforts in the healthcare system, where they're not necessarily high volume, where the cost per unit is high, where the care is complex, and where what's most important for the good of the patient is mm -hmm. collaboration of health professionals across the entire spectrum. Putting, pitting hospitals or institutions or health professionals against each other doesn't put the best interest of the patient first. So okay. there may be a role for these things, but I, I, would, I would be very hesitant to say that that role is across the board. Okay, Stephen, I, I do want to get to the inflation issue, but I got a feeling you want to say something about competition first as well. You want well, to weigh I in on that? See, 
I would say be careful for what you ask for. There is one system to the south of us that has a lot of competition. And there are subsystems in the U.S. like Kaiser Permanente, the Geisinger Health System, Intermountain Health, that deliver a superb combination of access, quality, and efficiency, and cost. And they have a very low market share. So the question is, why would that be? Why wouldn't people, employers, gravitate towards the best combination? Well, it's a, mis it's a mystery, but obviously this is not uh, an area where people behave like normal market consumers. Back to the Canadian scene, yes, it's a good thing to drive down certain costs and to be very efficient. But uh, picking up on what Danielle said, do we want a system where hospitals and other institutions compete with each other, uh, don't share their trade sec secrets about how to improve and how to get the best combination of quality and efficiency because we have decided to treat them as bidders on certain kinds of goods. I'd rather treat this as a public good that needs to be efficient, needs to be measured, needs to keep costs at a minimum and needs to do all of those things. But especially in other than metropolitan Canada, I don't think there's any real prospect in encouraging the standard form of competition. Okay, Brian, one See, more shot at it. Yeah, I, I, I want to um, use home care as an example because uh, something's happened recently in Ontario where we are looking for home care providers, half of them are public, ha uh, non-profit, half are for-profit, it, do it doesn't really matter in this case, and they are asked to compete for the quality of care and to cooperate with multiple professionals. So in the home care sector right now, you've got many organizations coming together in order to get those contracts. And those contracts will be based primarily on quality, secondarily at cost. And all we're asking for, and when, when I talk about competition, we're saying you need to earn the right to care for our patients and our clients. And just curious, That's in those cases about. of home care, are the privates or the, or the nonprofits winning contracts more than the other? Well, this has just started in the last couple of months, and in this case, there was one for-profit organization. It's being rolled out in four lens. One for-profit organization one, uh, received that contract, and two others in three different lens are nonprofits. And uh, we expect that they will all do equally well uh, because they're going to be measured on outcomes, and they'll be encouraged to innovate. Okay, Michael Decker. I'll declare my conflict. I chair the board of St. Elizabeth Healthcare, which is uh, the largest home care provider has done very well in a decade under the competitive system. And Brian points out the, the competitive system has changed. Just to clarify, non, St. Elizabeth's is a, a non not for profit Catholic charity mm -hmm. that will deliver one in four, one in five of the home care visits in the province, about $200 million this year. Has been ranked very high quality by everybody. It, it has not broken out. At first, the critics said it'll be a race to the bottom, the for profits will take the whole thing over. Didn't happen. Um, but it turned out that the home care agencies that couldn't adapt, couldn't deliver a better product in terms of price and quality, did lose market share, and, and they've had to change what they're doing. So VON, for example, brought in new leadership, started to get back in the game. But I'll go back to my time as deputy, which is a while ago. We brought in the home care agencies. We said 90% of Ontarians say when asked they want to die at home. They can only die at home if we can deliver pain management through home care. Hmm. So will you deliver pain management through home care? And the big home care providers in those days said, we're not interested. Now we were funding them 100%, hmm. but they had the ability to say, well, we're just not interested. When you have a competitive system and, you, and the citizen boards that run it put in the tender pain management, if you don't want to do it, you're out of the, you're game. Out of the game. So there is an ability there to innovate, to improve, and it hasn't turned out to be a race to the bottom. It's turned out to be a balancing act between price and quality. And, and, and it is big. It's, it's $1.2 billion a year. So it's not a tiny little experiment, but it works because they're multiple providers. And you can actually have a, a, a virtuous competition that's transparent. Got it. Let me, okay, Stephen, let me bring you back in now and get back to that issue of inflation and see whether or not that is part of what's driving costs so high. And again, maybe the, the comparison between uh, regular inflation as we all you know face when we gas up at the pumps or go shopping versus medical inflation which seems to follow different rules can you help us there <clears throat> medical inflation is always somewhat higher because we treat the technology somewhat differently we accept very very high costs uh, when a new technology enters the so-called healthcare market because the sunk costs the cost of development tend to be high and they want to recoup that very quickly but another source of the inflation, and as Michael said earlier, most of this is labor. 
And why is labor so inflationary? Well, let's look back to the health accords. When the federal government in the early part of the last decade said, we're going to do our mea culpa for cutting back transfer payments to the provinces in the 90s, we're going to give you a whole lot more money. Uh, we're going to make a deal that lasts till 2014, which includes built-in escalator clauses of 6% in addition to tens of billion dollars with almost no strings attached. Every bargaining agency in the country, every, every union, every medical association says, look, there's a ton of money coming down the pike. Let's get some of it. So we didn't design the system to be accountable for achieving some real benefits, buying some better quality, buying more efficiency and so on. We just said, we're going to give you a ton of money. The provinces, I think to their detriment, bargained for essentially unconditional transfers. And now we're all paying the price for it, including the provinces. And the result was, we have literally uh, doubled health care spending in the last decade, and in real terms, about 60 or 65 percent. And we haven't solved any, any of the major problems durably, although we're making some headway in some areas. Okay, let's talk doctor's wages. I know, Michael Decker, the first thing you mentioned on the list of why the system is as expensive as it is is because of the money we pay to the people who actually work in the system. Uh, Michael Smith, uh, page four at the top. Spending on physician services. Let's bring that graphic up. Here is the per capita spending on doctors. In the province of Ontario, the bar is bigger than in the rest of Canada. And Danielle, I guess the question I want to ask you is, as a family doc, are you overpaid? It's a good question. I mean, certainly if we're not delivering something different, uh, something better than what we were delivering when we were paid less, then the answer has to be yes, we are overpaid, right? I mean, the question is not how much do you spend in absolute dollars because uh, people will argue, well, we're in, a, in competition with the labor market in the United States and if we don't pay our doctors enough, they're all going to leave and head south and uh, uh, higher cost of living, et cetera. So there's all kinds of arguments. The point is not what's the absolute number that we're spending. The point is what are we getting for it? Okay, but are you we can't getting good value? You're really overpaid. Well, I, 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 hope, I hope not, right. but the question is what, what, what what are you getting for what you spend on me? That's what okay. we, that's to me the real question we should be asking. So are we paying doctors? Because certainly we weren't paying doctors that much more in Ontario 15 years ago. There's, uh, particularly in family medicine, there's been a significant increase in family doctors' salaries in the last decade in Ontario and across the country. I think that's a good thing because we need to be attracting people to family medicine. We have as a real, opposed to the specialties. As opposed to the other specialties, we have a real shortage of family physicians. And part of the reason is because family docs were traditionally underpaid in comparison mm. to other specialties. Okay. Ryan, but let me try this. Go ahead. Are we getting good quality for the money that we're spending? And if not, then what do we need to be doing differently to ensure we do? Okay. Brian, if you're the Minister of Health and you're looking to save a buck and you look at doctor salaries, what are you thinking? Well, I, I'm not going after all doctor salaries. What I'd be asking is exactly the same question. Are you giving more value for the dollars we spend? And we have been increasing the dollars spent uh, per physician uh, substantially. So we see anywhere from 25 to 35 percent increases per physician uh, over the last five years. Uh, and it varies by specialists and general practitioners. The GPs uh, have received a bit more and arguably they were underpaid, uh, relative to the specialists at least. Now, what we see though is uh, we are spending more uh, total relative to uh, the number of doctors. So we have about the same number of doctors per capita as we have in the past, and we're spending about 49% more for physicians. So I think we need to look at the different kinds of physicians, the different services, and it's, it's very hard for an economist to say whether, we're, whether anyone's overpaid or not if you've got real competition. These are negotiated uh, between the ministry and the mm -hmm. OMA, and we haven't, I don't think, seen across the board uh, differences in the quality of care. We're paying equally reg for things you do rather than how well you do them. Okay, let me get Michael Decker to break it down a little more. Are we getting more value for the increased dollars we're spending on doctor salaries? Oh, I, I think it's, it's hard to generalize about it. In some places we are, but several times the word salary has been used in connection with doctors. Right, which is the wrong word to it, use. If, if it were all salaries, it would be a lot easier to manage. But um, and, and there would be better benchmarks. But you've got a combination of things. For example, we said we want to reduce the wait time for cataract surgery. We're going to pump money in there. We have <coughs> made uh, the surgeons who are doing cataracts very well off because we've given them more volume. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, in a normal you know, e econ economy, 
if you bring in technology that allows more volume to be done, um, you, it, the benefit doesn't necessarily accrue to the people doing the volume. So if you, you know, change the configuration of, a, of a, an aircraft um, cockpit so that instead of three people, you got two people. The engineer is gone, replaced by a computer. You don't say, let's raise the pilot and co-pilot to divvy up the engineer's pay. In healthcare, often when we introduce a technology that speeds things up, so you can now do 20 cataracts a day instead of five, on a fee-for-service system, you're paying the same rate because rates are very sticky downward. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, the productivity gains, which have been virtuous for the patient, have been very virtuous for the provider, and the payor, the taxpayer, has kind of taken it in the ear a little bit because government hasn't negotiated toughly in some areas to pull down the rate per procedure. Mm -hmm. That's a tough thing to do, to say to someone, well, you know, this was worth, you know, a thousand dollars a piece when you were doing three a day, now you're doing 20 a day, it's not worth a thousand dollars anymore. But we, we have to tackle some of those volume things because two things move in the, in, in, in the pay of doctors. One is volume and the other is the pay per procedure. Mm. Um, and, and I come back to it, I, I, I know I was getting ahead on the hospitals, but when we started this system, we paid hospitals for being there and we paid doctors for every bit of piece work they did and we probably got some of it backwards. We should have paid family doctors for being there and keeping people healthy. And that's what we're trying to do now with modified payments, capitation, mixed models, is to try and buy a, a, a health rather than treatment of sickness. Gotcha. And, and that's important, and, and that should, should cause us to pay family doctors more. On the other end, we might want to pay a little less per procedure in some of the volume areas. So Stephen Lewis, if you're health minister, and I, I should say, uh, Deb Matthews, the health minister in Ontario, when asked, uh, I guess a few days ago, you know, you're going after the pharmacists, you want to go after the doctors too to try to save some money, she said, no plans to do that right now. You can read into that what you like, but do you think it's necessary to go after labor costs, for example, the compensation paid well, to doctors in order to bend the cost curve? I don't think the issue is, as I've said before, what is the appropriate amount of money to pay? Because that's, that's a, a, a distinct but separate issue. There are two other issues that haven't been addressed yet. One is, what do, we, what do we expect doctors to do and what do we force them to do by the payment system to earn whatever they earn? Well, we force them to do more things. So the more visits, the better. Uh, if you call me back five times instead of dealing with all of my five uh, complaints, at once in a fee-for-service system, you're going to make a lot more money. There, why Ontario's costs are higher than others is complicated, but there are a few things we need to put on the table. One is that we have an incredibly inefficient division of labor. We have primary care doctors doing the work that nurse practitioners can do. We have first-line specialists doing the work that primary care doctors should be doing. So in downtown Toronto, where, like every other major urban area in the country, you have a very high concentration of specialists uh, serving well-to-do populations. You have lots of pediatricians, obstetricians, gynecologists, and internal medicine specialists who are doing primary care, and we're paying for that. The other thing uh, is we haven't figured out a way to pay physicians how to keep people well. So a physician who has a smaller footprint on the system, by which I mean whose patients consume fewer drugs, have fewer hospitalizations, uh, get fewer kinds of diagnostic imaging tests because there is a lot more cognitive work being done, a lot more interaction with the patients, a lot more successful prevention and so on. That doctor is doing a fabulous service, but probably earns less money than the high volume practitioner who immediately refers tough cases to internal medicine or some other kind of specialist who orders a lot more tests and so forth. And that's really so you not have fixable? to look at the structure of medical practice if you're going to do something about this and change the game. And we haven't quite changed the game, although the family health teams in Ontario are potentially game-changing uh, if the culture changes along with it. Okay. Brian, t uh, talk to me about this. You know that uh, the, uh, the current Ontario government, the Liberals, uh, when they came in, in order to save some money, they delisted a bunch of services. You know, stuff that used to be covered, for example, uh, chiropractic, physiotherapy, certain eye examinations, they delisted those services and now people had to go into their own pockets. They have to go into their own pockets uh, if they want to get those services. That certainly saves the, the public purse money. Is that good policy? Well, I think we need to look to clinical expert panels to make that decision. You, you don't look to social scientists for that. 
but it, it is a way of controlling the supply. And just as in the 90s, we controlled costs by controlling the supply of uh, healthcare services, that's not good medicine. Uh, it's a way of cu uh, cutting or controlling costs. But okay, but as a means medicine. of cost cutting, do you, do you approve of that as, a, as an idea for cutting costs? Uh, no, what I'd rather see is that we allow uh, caregivers to substitute a variety of uh, alternative care uh, paths in order to achieve the outcome. So if chiropractor can uh, remove the need in, in some cases for orthopedic surgery, uh, I'd much rather see a caregiver or a caregiver team that's responsible for the outcome make those trade-offs. Right now, uh, as Stephen suggested, we're encouraging the, uh, that kind of procedure. And I don't think our healthcare professionals are intentionally providing care that they believe isn't necessary in order to make a buck. I don't think that mm -hmm. happens very much at all. But they are doing what the system rewards for, and, and we, we have to expect that they won't do those kinds of activities uh, for which they get no compensation. Right. So if we change the structure of the compensation scheme so we can bring multiple providers who are responsible for the entire cycle of care that a patient uh, goes through uh, and rewards for the outcomes, I think we'll find a great deal of innovation and many substitutes of less expensive procedures or services uh, from more expensive. Danielle, do you have any idea how you get around the idea of if a doctor keeps you healthier, he or she is poorer? It's tough. I mean, it's impossible in a, in a fee-for-service system mm -hmm. to provide incentives to keep people healthy. We're, we're just beginning now to look at ways to uh, make, incentivize, if you will, physicians, family doctors in particular in Ontario, mm -hmm. to keep our patients well. But they're pretty blunt instruments. So, for example, I uh, last year got a bonus uh, if mm -hmm. I made sure that a high proportion of the children in my practice were immunized, a high proportion of women over 50 had mammograms, a high proportion of women of reproductive age had pap tests, etc. That's an attempt to try to uh, incentivize prevention so that these people won't then come back into the system really sick and mm -hmm. cost us all a million dollars, not to speak of the human suffering. So uh, it's, that's a start. But it's difficult in a fee-for-service system uh, to, uh, to get around the incentive to volume. And, mm -hmm. and I should add that in the UK, where pay for performance, which I think we may touch on later, has been implemented to a large degree. So this idea of paying family doctors or GPs based on quality, uh, what we found is that there are perverse incentives in those systems as well. So if you say to physicians, we are only going to, we're, we're going to pay you substantially more if a high proportion of your practice quits smoking and a high proportion of your practice meets their targets for their blood pressure, et cetera, what ends up happening? Well, people who have mental illness don't get accepted into GP practices because mm. they're tough to manage sure. and don't, uh, don't comply with treatment recommendations recommendations or doctors refuse to take patients on who are smokers in their practices. So, and again, it's not about people being bad people or doing bad things. It's that when you, when you construct any payment scheme, there's bound to be a perverse incentive that, that comes into that and, and people are human and they, they do what they get paid for and they don't do what they don't get paid for. So uh, it, it's, a, it's going to be a, have to be a very intricate instrument, I think, if we want to really get at paying people to keep keep the population healthy. Michael Dector. Yeah, there's an elephant in the room we're not talking about. When we talk about prevention on one side, keeping people healthy, and we talk about treating illness, you've got a big, big <laughs> elephant called chronic disease. 900,000 Ontarians have diabetes, and we don't treat it very well. We treat it uh, you know, issue by issue, episodically. Someone goes into a coma, they end up in an emergency room. Badly treated, diabetes leads to heart disease, blindness, amputations. Well, well managed, and you need the patient to play a pretty major role, you can postpone many of those consequences for a long time. And the impacts are not long term. It's not like you have to really manage it for 10 years and then you get some benefit. When Kaiser Permanente put in strong diabetes and chronic disease management, they saw drops in heart attacks and other acute events almost immediately. So there, there, there's a, there is a bargain to be had here. And I think it's gonna take both carrots and sticks. I mean, we're going to have to, one way or the other, say there is a standard of care here. And if you meet it, there's an incentive. But you can't go on as a, as a physician licensed by a college and not meet a professional standard of care. And I think in some cases, we've, the profession has let itself off too easily on some of these things. There is an acknowledged 
right way to treat this and manage this disease. And I think at some point the College of Physicians and Surgeons is going to have to step up and say, okay, you know, it, it, you know, malpractice isn't just, you know, taking off the wrong breast. Malpractice is also not organizing your practice to support a patient with diabetes. Now, government has a big role in supporting and it's mm -hmm. trying to play it. But, you know, we're going to see patients, I think, shop for situations in which they get a really robust level of care. And we should incent that. But we shouldn't be bashful about saying some things are unacceptable gotcha. and, and not tackling, um, you know, diabetes until it's an amputation, mm -hmm. you know, is, is not acceptable. Let's talk about, uh, we've talked, uh, tackled, I guess, uh, physician compensation. Let's tackle hospital funding, as you talked about earlier. Uh, Stephen Lewis, to you first. Uh, we, hear, uh, we hear about different ways that hospitals are funded. There's global hospital funding. There are performance-based hospital funding. There is activity-based hospital funding. You want to just sort of give us the lay of the land there and explain what all that means? Well, uh, global funding is when you just give a hospital uh, a budget and say, go do your stuff. Uh, activity-based funding shifts it to, we are going to pay you for doing a certain number of things, and we'll price that out, and if, and if you don't meet your volume targets and so on, uh, we're not going to do it in a population-based funding, which is very difficult to do for a hospital unless it def serves only a defined area, would be you get per capita funding uh, and y whatever that turns out to be with some age sex factors built in and so on, we'll give it to you. The new rage is activity-based funding. Uh, BC has said it's moving towards it and other provinces are expressing a huge interest as well. The idea behind it is, uh, as was said earlier, instead of just giving a hospital a chunk of money and say, do what you want and we'll loosely have you account for it later, we want to pay for the things we want to buy from you. The basic premise of activity-based funding, there are two. One is you know what you want to buy. That is, you know how many procedures you think uh, they ought to do. You know how many emergency room visits you think they ought to provide and so on. And secondly, you actually know how much things cost, quite precisely. So how much does the hip replacement really cost? Not an approximation, not an average, but how much? And uh, have you got that fine-tuned? I think that the risk inherent in activity-based funding, funding is if you just move to that sort of scheme without having a conversation about appropriateness and without framing it with the notion that, you know, a really good healthcare system doesn't do more, it does less because we have met needs in other ways, you're setting yourselves up for two things. One is you are going to privilege certain kinds of discrete procedures like surgery over other kinds of care, chronic disease management and so forth, because they're easier to count and easier to do the accounting for. And secondly, you're probably going to beggar some other areas like medical admissions for the cognitively impaired and other very difficult to care for patient categories where it's complicated, you need a whole bunch of different services, they're not easy to manage, they're not easy to measure, and they're not easy to cost, to, to cost out. So let's say, I would say activity-based funding has some potential to make some parts of the system a little bit more efficient, but it's not a panacea. Okay, Brian Golden, if, again, if you're looking at this from how do, you, how do you prevent that bar graph from going right off the charts up to the top right-hand corner, the way we fund hospitals, what do you want to see done? Well, I don't think anyone would design a, a system that had global-based funding today. Um, it, uh, it doesn't encourage the right kinds of behaviors. So what we'll get with activity-based funding or where funding follows the patient is we'll get much more data about what's being, what's being done. Uh, the quality of that work can be built into that, needs to be built into that. And we will find, I believe, that there are many procedures uh, that don't need to be done, don't need to be in the hospital. And we will also encourage uh, specialization. So those hospitals that are particularly good uh, at both uh, achieving quality, uh, which also means only providing care when care is clinically needed, appropriate, and, and managing their costs, they will start to get the greater volume, assuming there, we are in some of these urban areas where there are potentially multiple uh, providers. But you'd start to see that. And we know in healthcare, volume for many procedures uh, contributes to quality. The more you do, the better you do it. And it also starts to achieve some uh, cost savings. So that's good for everyone. Right now, global funding doesn't, uh, doesn't encourage that kind of behavior. We also need to get away from procedures that shouldn't be done. Now, we uh, 
we have a substantial number of cesareans, twice what the World Health Organization would recommend, being done in Ontario hospitals. We have estimates of a quarter of the hysterectomies that are being done are inappropriate. So we need to build in uh, systems that encourage the right care at the right place and, and reward for volume and quality and cutting costs. Well, let me express the concern then to Daniel Martin, because I've heard it from, for example, hospitals in rural Ontario, who say if you take away global budgeting, you're really putting us at risk. If the money's going where the, you know, the majority of the patients are going, that's not in rural Ontario. Right. Activity-based funding can't work in rural communities, yeah. period. I mean, there's no way. I've worked in, in, in <coughs> rural communities. You, you cannot keep your volumes high enough mm -hmm. to keep your hospital doors open if all of your funding is coming in per, per patient or per procedure. So uh, when we talk about activity-based funding, we're really mostly talking about a mechanism for funding hospitals in large, crowded metropolitan areas where there are multiple hospitals and institutions where patients could go. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is I think we need to be conscious and be aware of any system that creates Profitable, profitable patients and unprofitable patients because that is what activity-based funding has led to in the United States and to some degree, although to a lesser extent in the UK, is uh, situations where, again, hospitals are looking to do those things that they get paid to do and, and looking to get out of the business of, get, of doing things where, where the money isn't following the patient to the, to the extent that they would like. So again, it's a tool. It's one way of, of, of paying hospitals but to if the government wanted to, to move holus volume, bolus to that area, you'd be opposed to I that. would be opposed to it holus bolus. I think it's got a role to play. And in fact, you know, it was used to great effect in bringing wait times down for hip and knee replacements in Ontario. And so I think there are areas, particularly where you have a service that is underprovided, where there are long wait lists and where it's easy to measure how many things you're doing and what the cost of those things is, it can be a very useful tool. But across the board, I think, it, it, again, it could have a lot of unintended consequences. The other thing to say about activity-based funding is that in many jurisdictions where it's been implemented, and I don't think this is the agenda in Ontario, but we need to be conscious of it, it has been a tool implemented for the express purpose of moving towards more privatization of services. So that the government says we, we, that we uh, assign a cost of $300 or whatever it is to a hip replacement, we no longer care who does that procedure. It can be done in a public hospital, it can be done in a private clinic, uh, and, and it's a means of introducing more for-profit uh, care into the system. And so, uh, while I don't think that that's particularly the agenda of the Ontario government, I, I do think that it is part of where BC is headed in announcing this, this proposal to move towards activity-based funding. And that's something that we need to make explicit so we can have a conversation about whether or not that's where we want things to go. Okay. Michael Decker, hospital budgets. Well, if I agree with everything that's been said. Um, y y this is one tool. Um, but let's understand the, the best defense for a public health care approach in Canada is its efficiency. If it isn't efficient, it will give way to something else. What you can't allow is for the public system to be inefficient because things are, are skimmed off. So this idea that only the private sector can operate clinics is a silly one. The most efficient place in Toronto for cataracts is the Kensington Health Center, which is a not-for-profit funded by the government just the same as the hospital that it replaced. Why is that? Well, why is it efficient? Because yeah. they found a better way of doing it. And if you go there and see it, it's remarkable. In your typical hospital, patient comes in for a cataract, they're in pre-op, and, and then they're put on a, 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 they're wheeled into the operating room, and orderlies put them on the operating room table, procedures done, and they're taken off the operating table into post-op. At the Kensington Clinic, they have a chair that they're in in pre-op, they're wheeled into the operating room, the chair folds up into an operating room table, hmm. procedure's done, then it folds down into a wheelchair. So they've eliminated all the lifting of patients, which always has the risk of a patient being dropped and injured, because these are generally elderly patients. So what they've done is taken this from a whole day to a couple of hours. They've made it more efficient. And when you see it, you start actually chuckling because it's so smart the way they've done it. And they're giving tours. I mean, so they're not, you know, they'd be very happy if everyone else followed them. Um, they've been innovative. And, 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 and that's the thing I'd say. You need to encourage innovation. Every time we've said the healthcare system is unsustainable. In the 50s, it was unsustainable because of polio, tuberculosis. And we, we defeated those with, with immunization, with vaccines. When I was deputy, there were a lot of 
people saying HIV AIDS would render the whole healthcare system, it would bankrupt it, be the end of it. There was innovation that dealt with that. In the 90s, a lot of our gains come, came from moving to day surgery. So things that had taken a week of hospital stay at great expense are now done on a day basis. So, you know, every time we, we think the system's unsustainable, it's actually innovation, uh, you know, of one sort or another that has, has bailed us out. So we need to have a culture of innovation. Mike Kirby said this in his Senate committee report, that, that the big teaching hospitals are actually engines of innovation. And we should treat them that way. They train the future leaders. It's going to be clinical leadership. It's going to be Danielle training somewhere innovative and then going up to, to Sioux Lookout or, or, or many of the places that you nobly go and bringing with you ideas about how to do something better that starts to transform efficiencies. Well, Brian, tell me whether you think this is innovation because the, probably the most controversial idea in Canada today being practiced to raise money uh, for the increasing demands and costs in the healthcare system was unveiled by the government of Quebec just very recently and that is a $25 uh, charge every time you want to go visit your doctor. Um, is that a good idea? Um, let me be blunt, it's an intellectually bankrupt idea. It makes no sense at all if you want to minimize your costs and elevate quality. We know that most, most of us uh, sitting around this table, for example, will pay that $25 copayment and we'll be able to do that. But there are many in, our, in the province who, for whom $25 is significant enough that they will have second thoughts about visiting a physician. If that's the intention, uh, I think it's a misguided one. The evidence shows that it will disproportionately hit the lower income uh, it will affect the quality of care they receive. Uh, they may, for example, a, a woman who uh, has a lump on her breast may put it off uh, visiting a physician for a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months, until uh, that lump is later diagnosed as breast cancer. It will discourage the use of, of physician care or medical care and it is a very regressive tax policy. Okay, you know what? I took a shot. I, I know Michael Dechter and Daniel Martin and Stephen Lewis are all opposed to the idea of user fees to go visit the doctor. I took a shot that the guy from the Rotman School might be in favor of some <laughs> kind of user fee, and I, I struck out on that one. But, but there is this, obviously the government of Quebec believes in it, and obviously there is a segment of the population that doesn't mind spending the money if it'll get more health care dollars into the system. And, of course, people like the Fraser Institute think that it's an important way to... Uh, tamp down um, yep. inappropriate use of the healthcare system. Michael Dector, why is this an idea that just won't die if everybody thinks it's such a bad idea? Well, because it has some surface appeal for people who believe in markets, but surface would be being generous to it. And this, I lived in Quebec when they brought this in the last time. People don't remember. They brought in a $5 emergency room fee. And I think enormously to the credit of the emergency room doctors, they simply refused to collect it. Now, one of the reasons they f refused to collect it was it wasn't for them. They didn't get to keep it. <laughs> so they said, why the hell should we collect this five bucks if we're not getting it? But they basically said, it's just a stupid idea because the person who's going to not have the five bucks is probably the person who needs the care the most. Some elderly person who's poor, who has you know, bronchitis, who doesn't go because of the five bucks or the 25 bucks, this can't be a turns vote into winner. pneumonia. This can't be a vote winner, so why do they do it? And then costs a lot more. Well... You know, you've got to understand the Quebec debate about health care is somewhat different than the rest of Canada. Tommy Douglas it wasn't the man of the century in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Claude Castonguay was the, the man who brought in Medicare in Quebec. He's an insurance executive, and he's reversed his view. He would probably strongly support this fee. Um, you know, and there are places where I would support cost-sharing and deductibles. You know, the Manitoba Drug Plan, for example, works very well with the, the citizen paying the first 200 bucks every year, and then it's cost shared. Why do I support that? Because I, I believe that there's a certain deterrent effect when you've got mar active marketing of, of a product. Um, and, it, you know, there's coverage for people who are on welfare, and there's, there, there are exemptions to it. But, you know, putting uh, 25 bucks between um, elderly, fragile, worried people and primary care is, is about as dumb an idea as, as one could imagine. And there is a, all of the evidence 
tells you that. Okay, I mean, let me it's try never this. worked anywhere. Let's go to the land of Tommy Douglas then. And uh, when I do that, Stephen Lewis, I'm actually going to throw a quote your way first. And this is from your former finance minister, Janice McKinnon, who was on this program a couple of weeks ago, talking about another idea that, sh that, uh, that she supports, uh, which she believes, uh, you know, would uh, add some dollars to the health care system and make those who use the system pay a little more. But it's not user fees. Have a listen and then we'll talk. Roll tape, please. When uh, Medicare was created, Tom Kent was the policy advisor to Prime Minister Pearson. He, what he advocated was that 25% of the funding for health care should come by making health care a taxable benefit. That is, you could make the whole system or part of the system a taxable benefit. Just, you know, like you get your T4s for your income, you'd get your T4 for you, your use of the health system that year. It would go on your income tax. It would be related to your ability to pay. And one thing about an income tax system, it's very easy to, you know, have ceilings or put your people, you have a catastrophic condition, so this doesn't apply to you. It's got a lot of flexibility in it. I think that is, is a much better approach than what Quebec is taking. Stephen, what do you think? Um, I guess I'd say harebrained. Uh, <laughs> Get off the if, fence. Tell me what you really think. If, if uh, first of all, the premise that we need to get more money into health care, uh, I, I just don't agree. Uh, I think we've shown the one thing we know with all the health debates is that money doesn't solve the problem. The problem is quality and appropriateness and certain kinds of efficiency, and neither of which seem to have improved with massive increases in spending. We have a progressive income tax system and I think that is the best way to fund health care. And I think I would slightly disagree with Michael, even on the drugs. I think the fact that we have co-payments and deductibles makes the drug uh, prescribing and consumption business more of a free-for-all. And it's no accident that its costs are rising faster than any, any other sector. We don't actively manage it. In fact, we don't actively manage a whole lot of health care spending, but we manage that one even less. And just back to Quebec, because I think this is quite important. I think Quebec is thrown in the towel. I mean, we think the, the debate in Quebec is always the separatists and the non-separatists and so on with, with the PQ and the Liberals, but actually we're seeing in the government and, and re, a repeated refrain of kind of a neoconservative view of health care here, where they no longer believe that you can control health care spending and utilization, that you can improve quality and that those are your solutions. So they keep proposing with the last cast on gay report this one is saying we're just going to offload and a few years ago they talked about people buying long-term residential care insurance and so forth so i think the real ideological battle about uh, the future of the system and whether a public system is going to stand up is in quebec and when you layer on top of that the fact that montreal is the true hotbed of for-profit private care in Canada, you, you, it's, a, it's a really interesting scenario, and I think everyone ought to keep, a, keep an eye on it. Okay, four minutes to go. Danielle, on the issue uh, that uh, Janice McKinnon raised as a taxable benefit in healthcare? I mean, I just am afraid it doesn't make very much sense. Why would you tax the sick more than, than everybody else? Why, we have a, a perfectly adequate uh, means in place of collecting taxes to fund all kinds of uh, social services, including health care, and it works well. So I, I don't see why we would add another layer of complexity. Because there's a, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating this, I'm saying, because there has to be a recognition that if you use the system, you need to have a better understanding of what you're costing the taxpayer. But people don't use the system for fun. People use the system because they're sick. They don't have a choice about uh, whether to come in and, and uh, be admitted to hospital or whether they're admitted to hospital four times. And frankly, uh, when they're admitted to hospital four and five and six times a year, often it's because people like me aren't doing a good enough job of keeping them out of hospital and managing their illness well in the community. So uh, to, to tax the patient in that circumstance makes no sense to me at all. Michael? There's not a lot of women signing up for recreational hysterectomy. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I mean come on. Yeah. you know, they're, they're, you know, the use in the system is not for the most part driven by patient demand. There's a few areas. Diagnostics is one area that you probably have to push back a little because people hear that an MRI is better than a CAT scan, is better than an x-ray. And, and the answer is for some things an x-ray is quite adequate. For some things you don't even need an x-ray. I mean they proved that the Ottawa ankle rule. They were x-raying everyone who came in with a sore ankle and they discovered that you could do a couple of things and decide that 80 percent of those x-rays were unnecessary. So we probably need to push back a little there. But to come to, and I've had this debate with Janice McKinnon, first thing I'd say is the people who favor taxing the sick for health care are people who are no longer in politics. <laughs> Which they never not. favored it when they were running for office, and no one would ever get elected in Canada on that platform. 
And much as I admire Tom Kent, um, I, I think the idea was silly in the 60s, and it's still silly. Um, you think about how randomly distributed health costs are. We're all healthy. Any one of us could step off the curb tonight, be hit by a bicycle, mm. as that, that poor CBC producer was in Montreal, and spend the next two years in hospital mm. at a cost of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Now, say we survive that. Do you think the right thing to do is to land us with a tax bill for 25% of that amount? I don't. I think the whole point of having a big pool and having that borne on the backs of taxpayers, not individuals, is, is because it's impossible to predict who is going to incur high costs and when they're going to incur them. And, you know, so you want the big pool. The Americans have spent, you know, 40 years trying to find a way that doesn't involve constructing a big pool to deal with this. And, you know, it turns out there isn't one. You actually need the solidarity principle if you're going to have a health system based on need. Now, it's not perfect, but, you know, I, I'm with Stephen, if we need more money, and I'm not certain that we do, there are perfectly good, fair tax systems in this country that can raise the money. Uh, but so you don't have to go to a user fee, you don't have to tax it back on people on, uh, at income tax time? No, but you have to be tougher about managing it. You can't, as government, say, this is such a good thing. We, we never have to make tough decisions. You've got to make tough decisions all the time. Can politicians do that? They, they can when their backs are to the wall. They'll do everything else first, but they will come to making tough decisions, as they did in the 90s, because preserving the system requires it to be affordable. Gotcha. That's going to be the last word today. I want to thank you. know, it's amazing we talk health care for an hour, and not once did Barack Obama's name come up or any of what's going on south of the border, at least not in that regard. He's right down the street with me. A good Canadian discussion. Okay, he is, isn't he? He's giving yeah, he that big is. speech in New York today to Wall Street. That's right. Okay, give him our best from up here in the Great White North. Uh, that's Brian Golden from the Rotman School of Business who finds himself in New York City today. Hold your finger up for a second. There you, you go. The system. Uh, he used the public health care system and it worked, right? It was brilliant. Good for you. Okay, Stephen Lewis, great to have you on the line from Saskatoon as well. Thanks so My much friend. for your contributions today. Michael Dechter, the former Deputy Minister of Health for the province of Ontario. Danielle Martin, Canadian doctors for Medicare, who the last time she was here was much larger <laughs> and... and and you aren't today because you left something in the uh, That's waiting right. room. That's right. My, my six-month-old daughter is in, the, is in the room next door and waiting And she's gorgeous. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done.